Story 20 of Lucy Maud Montgomery's Short Stories, 1905 to 1906. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Glover. Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories, 1905 to 1906 by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Story 20. The Fraser Scholarship. Elliot Campbell came down the main staircase of Marwood College and found himself caught up with a whoop into a crowd of sophs who were struggling around the bulletin board. He was thumped on the back and shaken hands with amid a hurricane of shouts and congratulations. "'Good for you, Campbell. You've won the Fraser. See your little name tacked up there at the top of the list, bracketed off all by itself for the winner? Elliot H. Campbell, ninety-two per cent. Glass yell for Campbell, boys.' While the yell was being given with a hardiness that might have endangered the roof, Elliot, with flushed face and sparkling eyes, pushed near to the important typewritten announcement on the bulletin board. Yes, he had won the Fraser Scholarship. His name headed the list of seven competitors. Roger Brooks, who was at his side, read over the list aloud. Elliot Campbell, 92. I said you'd do it, my boy. Edward Stone, 91. Old Ned ran you close, didn't he? But, of course, with that name he'd no show. K. Milton, 88. Who'd have thought slow-going old K. would have pulled up so well? Seaton Brown, 87. Oliver Field, 84. Arthur McIntyre, 82. A very respectable little trio. And Carl McLean, 70. <sighs> what a drop! Just saved his distance. It was only his name took him in, of course. He knew you weren't supposed to be strong in mathematics. Before Elliot could say anything, a professor emerged from the president's private room bearing the report of a freshman examination, which he proceeded to post on the freshman bulletin board, and the rush of students in that direction left Elliot and Roger free of the crowd. They seized the opportunity to escape. Elliot drew a long breath as they crossed the campus in the fresh April sunshine, where the buds were swelling on the fine old chestnuts and elms that surrounded Marwood's red brick walls. Well, that has lifted a great weight off my mind, he said frankly. A good deal depended on my winning the Fraser. I couldn't have come back next year if I hadn't got it. That four hundred will put me through the rest of my course. Well, that's good, said Roger Brooks heartily. He liked Elliot Campbell, and so did all of the sophomores. Yet none of them was at all intimate with him. He had no chums as the other boys had. He boarded alone, dug persistently, and took no part in the social life of the college. Roger Brooks came nearest to being his friend of any, yet even Roger knew very little about him. Elliot had never before said so much about his personal affairs as in the speech just recorded. "'I'm poor. Woefully poor,' went on Elliot gaily. His success seemed to have thawed his reserve for the time being. "'I had just enough money to bring me through the fresh and soft years by dint of careful management. Now I'm stone-broke, and the hope of the Fraser was all that stood between me and the dismal certainty of having to teach next year.' dropping out of my class and coming back in two or three years' time a complete rusty stranger again. <sighs> I made faces over the prospect. No wonder, commented Roger. The class would have been sorry if you had to drop out, Campbell. We want to keep all our stars with us to make a shining coruscation at the finish. Besides, you know we all like you for yourself. It would have been an everlasting shame if that little cat of a McLean had won out. Nobody likes him. <laughs> I had no fear of him, answered Elliot. I don't see what induced him to go in anyhow. He must have known he had no chance. But I was afraid of Stone. He's a born dabster at mathematics, you know, and I only hold my own in them by hard digging. Why, Stone couldn't have taken the Fraser over you in any case if you'd made over seventy, said Roger with a puzzled look. You must have known that. McLean was the only competitor you had to fear. I don't understand you said Elliot blankly. "'You know the conditions of the Fraser,' exclaimed Roger. "'Certainly,' responded Elliot. <clears throat> "'The Fraser scholarship, amounting to four hundred dollars, will be offered annually in the sophomore class. The competitors will be expected to take special examination in mathematics, and the winner will be awarded two hundred dollars for two years payable in four annual installments, the payment of any installment to be conditional on the winners attending the required classes for undergraduates and making satisfactory progress therein.' Isn't that correct? Well, so far as it goes, old man, but you forgot the most important part of all. Preference is given to competitors of the name Fraser, Campbell, or McLean. 
provided that such competitor makes at least 70% in his examination. You don't mean to tell me that you didn't know that. Are you joking? demanded Elliot with a pale face. Not a joke, why, man, it, it, it's in the calendar. I didn't know it, said Elliot slowly. I, I read the calendar announcement only once, and I, I certainly didn't notice that condition. Well, uh, that's curious, but how on earth did you escape hearing it talked about? It's always discussed extensively among the boys, especially when there are two competitors of the favored names, which doesn't often happen. I'm not a very sociable fellow, said Elliot with a faint smile. You know they call me the hermit. As it happened, I never talked the matter over with anyone or heard it referred to. I wish I'd known this before. Well, why? I mean, what difference does it make? It's all right, anyway. But it is odd to think that if your name hadn't been Campbell, the Fraser would have gone to McLean over the heads of Stone and all the rest. Their only hope was that you would both fall below seventy. That's an absurd condition, but there it is in old Professor Fraser's will. He was rich, had no family, so he left a number of bequests to the college on ordinary conditions. I suppose he thought he might humor his whim in this one. His widow is a dear old soul and always makes a special pet of the boy who wins the Fraser. Uh, well, here's my street. So long, Campbell. Elliot responded almost curtly and walked onward to his boarding house with a face from which all the light had gone. When he reached his room, he took down the Marwood calendar and whirled over the leaves until he came to the announcement of bursaries and scholarships. The Fraser announcement, as far as he had read it, ended at the foot of the page. He turned the leaf and, sure enough, at the top of the next page, in a paragraph all by itself, was the condition. Reference shall be given to candidates of the name Fraser, Campbell, or McLean, provided that said competitor makes at least seventy per cent in his examination. Elliot flung himself into a chair by his table and bowed his head on his hands. He had no right to the Fraser scholarship. His name was not Campbell, although perhaps nobody in the world knew it save himself, and he remembered it only by an effort of memory. He had been born in a rough mining camp in British Columbia, and when he was a month old his father, John Hanselpacker, had been killed in a mine explosion, leaving his wife and child quite penniless and almost friendless. One of the miners, an honest, kindly Scotchman named Alexander Campbell, had befriended Mrs. Hanselpacker and her little son in many ways, and two years later she married him. They returned to their native province of Nova Scotia and settled in a small country village. Here Elliot had grown up, bearing the name of the man who was a kind and loving father to him, and whom he loved as a father. His mother died when he was ten years old, and his stepfather when he was fifteen. On his deathbed he asked Elliot to retain his name. "'I've cared for you and loved you since the time you were born, lad,' he said. You seem like my own son, and I've a fancy to leave you my name. It's all I can leave you, for I'm a poor man, but it's an honest name, lad, and I've kept it free from stain. See that you do likewise, and you'll have your mother's blessing and mine. Elliot fought a hard battle that spring evening. Hold your tongue, keep the Fraser, whispered the tempter. Campbell is your name, you've borne it all your life, and the condition is a ridiculous one. No fairness about it. You made highest marks, and you ought to be the winner. It isn't as if you were wronging Stone or any of the others who worked hard and made good marks. If you throw away what you've won by your own hard labor, the Fraser goes to McLean, who only made a seventy. Besides, you need the money, and he doesn't. His father's a rich man. <sighs> but I'll be a cheat and a cad if I keep it, Elliot muttered miserably. Campbell is not my legal name, and I'd never again feel as if I had the right of love to it if I stained it by a dishonest act for it would be stained, even though nobody but myself knew it. Father said it was a clean name when he left it, and I cannot soil it. The tempter was not silent so easily as that. Elliot passed a sleepless night of indecision, but next day he went to Marwood and asked for a private interview with the President. As a result, an official announcement was posted that afternoon on the bulletin board to the effect that, owing to a misunderstanding, the Fraser Scholarship had been wrongly awarded. Carl McLean was posted as winner. The story soon got around campus, and Elliot found himself rather overwhelmed with sympathy. But he did not feel as if he were very much in need of it after all. It was good to have done the right thing and be able to look your conscience in the face. He was young and strong, and could work his way through Marwood in no time. No condolences, please, he said to Roger Brooks with a smile. I'm sorry I lost the Fraser, of course, but 
I've my hands and brains left. I'm going straight to my boarding house to dig with double vim, for I've got to make an examination next week for a provincial school certificate. Next winter I'll be a flourishing pedagogue in some upcountry district. He was not, however. The next afternoon he received a summons to the president's office. The president was there, and with him was a plump, motherly-looking woman of about sixty. Mrs. Fraser, this is Elliot Hanselpacker, or Campbell, as I understand he prefers to be called. Elliot, I told your story to Mrs. Fraser last evening, and she was greatly interested when she heard your rather peculiar name. She will tell you why herself. I had a young half-sister once, said Mrs. Fraser eagerly. She married a man named John Hanselpacker and went west, and somehow I lost all trace of her. There was, I regret to say, a coolness between us over her marriage. I disapproved of it, because she married a very poor man. When I heard your name, it struck me that you might be her son, or at least know something about her. Her, her name was Mary Helen Rodney, and I loved her very dearly, in spite of our foolish quarrel. There was a tremor in Mrs. Fraser's voice, and an answering one in Elliot's, as he replied, Mary Ellen Rodney was my dear mother's name, and my father was John Hanselpacker. Then you are my nephew, exclaimed Mrs. Fraser. I am your Aunt Alice. My boy, you don't know how much it means to a lonely old woman to have found you. I am the happiest person in the world. She slipped her arm through Elliot's and turned to the sympathetic president with shining eyes. He is my boy forever, if he will be. Blessings on the Fraser scholarship. Well, blessings rather on the manly boy who wouldn't keep it under false colors, said the president with a smile. I think you are fortunate in your nephew, Mrs. Fraser. So, Elliot Hansel Packer Campbell came back to Marwood the next year after all. End of the Fraser Scholarship, recorded by John Glover, San Francisco.